in the center of the toboggan, you find a lever which is the brake, it's forward to go, backwards to stop. So welcome to part two of my vlog on Penskanor Wildlife Park in Kilfru in Neath. Now in part one, I went to find the abandoned remains of what's left. But after posting that video on YouTube, I was inundated with comments from people who remember the park growing up, even people who worked there, who now live and work in places like Scotland, London, and one guy who's now even in Florida. And there were so many great memories, but also unanswered questions. The one overriding question, just why did they decide to close the park in 1998? Well, today I'm hoping to answer that question because I've come to Langland to chat to a guy called Jonathan Quant. Now, Jonathan took over the park from his grandfather who built the park, but ultimately made the decision to sell it in 1998. And I'm off to find out why. I was born in in the park, um, which was started by my uh, by my grandfather um, as as a private collection. So my my earliest memories probably go back to when I was sort of three four years old, uh, running around with a little plastic tractor and a, and a macaw called Charlie. It was more than amazing. It was it was an incredible place to to grow up. Um, it, it was everything that you could ever imagine and more. I mean, me and my sister grew up there. We come home from from school, um, and they'd, they'd, they'd be a chimpanzee or two, you know, in in the house. Um, the chimps actually were, were, were one of the few animals that were allowed to be in the house. We we you know we had all these birds and animals in the park. Um, and, but the rule was they, they they wouldn't be in the house apart from a select sort of few and and um, the, the chimpanzees uh, that were born in the park had to be taken away from the parents because uh, they couldn't raise them. They actually um, uh, we lost uh, the first born chimp um, that was killed by the father. So after that we had to take them away and and, and hand rear them ourselves. And that was uh, that was done in my in my grandparents' house. So I come home from school, and you know there'd be a couple of chimps in in the kitchen. I grew up in Penskin House. Uh, it's it's a hundred and thirty year old manor house that was semi derelict when my when my grandfather bought it. Um, I loved the place there, and I I continue to live in Penskin. Uh, in Penskinner House um, after the park was closed up until I think somewhere around 2011 2012 um, when, when I, I moved out uh, and it was sold um, to a couple who look after young adults with learning difficulties Asperger's and that sort of thing on a one-to-one -one sort of basis so you know, when, when we were there with, with Penn Skinner, we were looking after birds and animals and, and, and now uh, you've got someone else looking after, looking after other, you know, other people. So, I mean, I, I grew up with this larger than life person that was full of adventure, full of um, uh, exploring and he, you know he would he would go off for a month to Indonesia uh, where he filmed the Komodo dragon and uh, which was a film that was then shown on the BBC and then he'd go off with his safari gear on yeah um, and, uh, to to the Amazon and, um, as those adventures that led to him discovering an alpine slide and bringing that back to the park and, yeah wh wherever he went and he'd come back with some idea or other um, and being the kind of man that he was he'd have an idea one minute and he'd put it into action and start building it the next minute um, and it was just constant sort of ideas and he'd been on some trip to Germany uh, and came back with this idea of he'd been on this slide um, and before you know it there's a chairlift been fitted there's a chairlift going in and and you know a massive engineering project to get this to get this slide down 
um, at a cost at the time of uh, of two hundred a quarter of a million pound. Back at a time when a quarter of a million pound was a lot of money, um, and he, you know he he put this in there, but it had the effect of doubling visitor numbers, um, paying for itself within I think two two years, uh, and was a massive um, attraction to to the area. I mean, people come from, and I think I think if you talk to people, their main sort of memories of Penn Skinner would be the chimps, the trout, feeding the trout, and the alpine slide. And we were world renowned um, for, for, for uh, the breeding records that we had. And we, we, were, we were one of the few parks in the world that were allowed to, to look after golden lion tamarinds. I think the, the secret with the park there is that it, it, it was built into a natural environment. In, in, in the forest, uh, running natural running water, waterfalls. So the, the, the birds and animals there were obviously very, very happy with that environment. Um, and, uh, and the breeding record that we had was sort of second to none. And, and David, I mean, I remember David Field very, very well. He lived next door to me. The, the penguins that he sort of hand reared. And when you, when you hand rear penguins, um, along with most other birds, you have to feed them every two to three hours around the clock. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> I remember I'd be coming home from Ritzy's nightclub or whatever at three in the morning. Barons. And, and bar <laughs> Baron. And, um, you know, three, yeah. two, three and four in the morning. And the light would always be on in Davis because he'd be up and sort of feeding these, these penguins and, and if you've got one penguin that needs feeding every two to three hours that's one thing but if you've got 10 or 20 by the time you've fed the last one <laughs> it's time to start feeding the first one again. My grandfather put the, um, the chairlift and alpine slide in uh, it, it doubled visitor numbers and what I think what, what you've got to what people have got to remember is that Penn Skinner grew and came from uh, a love of, of animals that my grandfather had and it was a hobby. It started as, a, as one man's private collection that people wanted to come and, and see. He opened it on a couple of charity days uh, where he would charge people to come in uh, and the money would go to a local charity and it, it kind of grew from there. So it grew from a hobby. He never, he never took a wage from the park, no interest in, in that. That, that. That wasn't what the park was designed to do. I took over the park in about a month or so before Easter in 1996. Uh, I had just um, moved back from living in, uh, in, in Belgium, in Brussels, uh, and walked into a meeting with uh, the bank manager and our accountants that um, where it, it, it had sort of pointed out to us that that the park had been losing money for the previous 10 years uh, and I think the, the season before I took it over the, the, the loss was sort of 120 130,000 pound cash loss um, and it was a case of what what do we do with it uh, and it was it was decided that 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 I would take over to try to sort of d turn that around. That first year, uh, we brought the losses down from sort of 120,000 to around about I think 25, 28,000 pound loss. The season after that, they came down again to four or five thousand pound loss. And the last season that we that we were open, which was the season of 1998. Um, we were realistically looking to make a profit for the first time in about 10, 12 years uh, of around £50,000. By the time we got halfway through May, I had to revise those predictions um, and predicted we'd probably end up making a loss of around £150,000 just because of the weather. Uh, you know, the, the, we would be up from Monday to Friday, the weather could be great and visitor numbers would be up. 
the weekend, which was our main time and school holidays, it rains, we'd end up down. So it was a case of by that, by that sort of May, um, I basically sat down and said, look, really all we're doing here is gambling on the weather, which in the UK and the weather patterns the way they've been yeah. probably wasn't the best idea of all. Uh, and that we were suddenly now looking at, instead of making a £50,000 profit, making £150,000 loss again. Um, so that was really the sort of decision and turning point of where we needed to go in the future. And that must have been a heart-wrenching decision, spending your entire childhood growing up in this amazing place, then through to, what, 98, having the decision to close it. That, that must have been, you know, weighing heavily on your mind, you know, your family, your grandparents as well, and then ultimately the future. Yeah, it, it was. Emotionally, it was, it was a heart-wrenching decision to make. It was a difficult decision to make. Logically and from a business perspective, it was a pretty brain-dead easy decision to make. When we closed, we had around 1,900 birds and animals in the park. 1,400, 1,500 of those were on loan to us from other parks. So they either went back to where they came from or um, or went to wherever they, they asked us to send them. At the same time, we had about two and a half thousand birds and animals that belonged to us that were out on loan in other parks, which were left where they were, uh, which left us then with a couple of hundred uh, birds and animals. The, um, the, the, the animals that went the furthest were the penguins. They went to Laurel Park in Tenerife. Uh, the most difficult animals to place with the chimpanzees. At one point they, was, they were looking like they would be going to Mumbai in India um, until then the people just up the road near Danarogov uh, stepped forward and uh, wanted to take them there and a decision was made then that even though um, the, the park in, in Mumbai were prepared to pay for these animals the age of, the, of some of the animals and the distance involved and the travel involved, there was a high risk of one or two of them not making that journey. So uh, a decision was made to, to send them 10 miles up the road uh, rather than to the other side of the world. So that's where, that's where they ended up. And really when you, when you look at it, there, there was nowhere else like it really. Um, you know, the, the closest park would be, would be Bristol zoo and we were actually bigger than uh, in, in in size of area uh, ended up being that than than bristol zoo you know and um yeah i th i think there were just so many memories that people would have of coming to the park um i think as well the, the proximity that they could get to the animals with us was greater than, than than a lot of other parks. You know, the, the, the chimpanzees would come out and there'd be a chimpanzee tea party once or twice a day and do you know where they'd the chimps would usually go and steal an ice cream off of a kid or two. Um, you know yeah. uh, so th there was there was an element there where they could really kind of get up close to 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 these animals from from all around the world. So we close its doors in 98, having seen some of the footage of, of what's left. Uh, what's your thoughts on kind of the remains of, uh, of what was the park? I haven't been back to, to the park for, for, quite, for quite a long time now. Um, you know, the memories that I have there will, will stay with me forever. Uh, and you know, nature has done its job now. Nature is, is, is clearly looking at some of the footage there as, as reclaimed, um, as reclaimed it for itself. Yeah, and, and what you've got to remember and realize is that that work was all done by hand. It, it, because of the terrain and because it is built into a mountain, um, you know, all those footings had to be dug out by hand, all the, the stonework and, and and, and work that went into it, the steel work and everything, that that still remains pretty much as it was. And if you look at the, um, if you look at how the decay of of the other buildings and parts of the park, that structure 
has remained there pretty much intact as, as it was. The biggest regret that, that I have about, have about closing the park is that my, my youngest daughter, who wasn't born at the time, never got to experience any of it. Um, my two older daughters experienced it for a short period of time. Uh, but Isabel, you know, never knew. All, all she's got is sort of this, the stories and what, what people in the family have sort of told her, which is, you know, quite sad that she never got to experience what, what me and my sister got to experience, uh, yeah. really. So, yeah, it's, it's quite emotional when I, when I see, when I see the, where it is now. But I have got a lifetime of, of fantastic, great memories of growing up there.